Thank you for joining us for our webinar, How to Develop Emotional Resilience. Our agency continues to be here to serve the community during this challenging time by adapting our services to meet your needs. We are proud to be able to share the professional insight of our licensed counselors in order to provide much needed emotional and psychological support as we navigate this crisis together. The presentation today will be led by Terry Cheresnik. Terry is a licensed clinical social worker and a licensed clinical alcohol and drug counselor. Terry works with clients of all ages and helps them manage chronic anxiety, depression, stress, and other mental health concerns. Throughout the presentation, please feel free to submit questions or comments through the Q&A or chat at any time, and Terry will address them at the end of her presentation. Terry, take it away. Hello and welcome. I thought it may be helpful to present some information on emotional resilience, since many people have been feeling stressed and overwhelmed by the various events that have been evolving this year, on top of the regular daily stressors we all experience. Stress is defined as the body's reaction, and that can be physical, mental, or emotional reaction to any change that requires an adjustment or response. So something happens in our environment which causes us to react. For example, we may lose our job, we fear uncomfortable wearing a mask to go out, we're dealing with financial problems. Sometimes it's easy to roll with the punches and deal with the stressors, and then other times not so much. Our ability to adapt, respond to, and recover from stressful events in our life is our emotional resilience. The word resilience comes from the Latin word for resilio, which means to bounce back or rebound. We're being emotionally resilient when we're exhibiting traits like resourcefulness, flexibility, perseverance, as an example. I like to use the analogy of standing in the ocean to help describe emotional resilience. So take a moment, if you would, and picture yourself down the shore standing in the water, enjoying the sunshine. Sometimes the waves are gentle. We stand in the warm water with our back to the gentle ripple of the waves coming in, enjoying the ebb and flow of the water, rocking us gently back and forth. There's an easygoing rhythm to the ocean's movements around us. But sometimes the ocean water gets rougher and the waves come in one right after another. We stand with our back to the waves looking at the shore and find it hard to stay upright. One large wave comes pounding in and knocks us to our knees. We work hard to plan our feet and stand up, but before we can gain our balance, another one comes from out of nowhere. And we are now rolling under the water, trying to gain control of our body, get our head above the water, and catch a breath. But what happens? If we turn and face the waves, we now see when a wave is developing on the horizon. Can we plant our feet a little firmer in the sand to maintain balance? What if we jump up over a wave if it's not too big? If we spend some time running along the shoreline, can we develop stronger leg muscles to stand firmly when the strongest waves come in? How about holding someone's hand when we can't stand upright or by ourselves? or riding a boogie board in with a wave. The waves are symbolic of life, sometimes embracing and gentle, sometimes intensely unsettling. We have little control over many of the unexpected life events that come our way. A sudden illness, the death of a loved one, a car accident, a business failure. However, we can develop skills, the emotional resilience to stay upright above the water or to ride the wave to safety. But before I discuss ways to improve emotional resilience, I'd like to bring up two other points. The first one is, we're not born with or without resiliency. It's not something that's all or nothing. You know, babies are born with varying degrees of adaptability and sensitivity to their environment. We all have known babies that were just easygoing, rolled with things, and some that were a little bit harder to, to handle what was coming their way. 
resiliency can be learned throughout life and developed through our lifetime. So it's a skill we can continue to build upon and improve. And the second point is emotional resilience can vary between different areas of our life. For example, you may be very resilient in your work life and you can just handle everything that's thrown your way, but find unbelievable frustration really triggered easily in your personal life. And that, that is a little bit more of a struggle. So again, it's not all or nothing and it can vary depending on different aspects of your life. So the question is, how do we develop and improve our emotional resilience? I've pulled together 10 strategies that I'd like to present. Um, they're all research-based and they're present presented in no particular order. There are many, but I, I thought these were the 10 that I most wanted to focus on. The first one is be an optimist. Now, I'm not talking about the rose-colored glasses, delusional optimist, but, but a realistic optimist. And by that, I mean someone who looks at what is negative going on around them, sees what's relevant to the problems they're facing. They disengage from the problems outside their control, and they turn their attention to problems they believe they can address. So you acknowledge the problem, but then you see what, if anything, about the problem directly impacts you and that you can work on. Be realistic about the world, but also confident in your abilities that you can make positive changes to the problems within your control. Also, see if you can reframe your point of view about the negative event from, instead of thinking, this is a catastrophe, to, hmm, this is a challenge. The event didn't change, did it? Your perspective did. One viewpoint seems really insurmountable, but the other, eh, it's something difficult, but it seems workable. Optimism is a skill you can learn. The next one, find a sense of purpose and meaning in your life. Resilient people have a mission and a purpose in their life that gives meaning to the things that they do. When tough times roll in, they feel a greater purpose is behind them, propelling them forward. That purpose can be, I go to work to provide for my family, or my role is to care for my loved ones. We can also start to develop our purpose in small ways. So for example, for the next week, identify your focus. Take the time to acknowledge how you want to spend your time and energy. It could be as simple as, I'm going to call my friend because he's been feeling down, or I'm going to donate to a charity I believe in. When we have a purpose, it nourishes us. The next one is, Face your fears. When we avoid something we are afraid of, the fear inside us grows. It doesn't go away, it gets worse. However, when you face your fears, the intensity of the fear lessens. We can't just talk ourselves out of the fear, but we have to address the fear one step at a time. As an example, if we have a fear of speaking in public, it can be helpful to begin addressing this fear by starting a conversation with a neighbor. Then work up to giving a toast at a dinner party, each time taking a slightly bigger step towards your goal. During this exposure therapy, we start to change the negative associations we have to situations or objects, being able to believe that that wasn't so bad, I can do it. Next, the next one, be adaptable and flexible. But before we discuss this next skill, I'd like to try a little experiment if we can. This was something I had seen another therapist present and I believe it really can teach us a little bit more about resilience. So if you would, please stand up staying just where you are, okay? Now, touch something, anything. Okay, now pick something else to touch. I hope you're doing it. Let me ask you, did you use your hand to touch? 
you don't need to like write in the chat or tell me, but just for answer for yourself. Did you use your hand? In past experiments, most everyone says they've used their hand to do the touching. Did you? So why is it that most everyone does the same thing? In a word, habit. Our brains tell us there's one way to solve this problem because it's how we've always done it. This is how we touch. Let's try another little experiment. Standing again, this time, put your hands behind your back and picture them tied together so your arms are of no use to you now. Okay, this time, touch something. Hmm, what did you use? If not your hand, maybe your foot, your toe, your leg, your hip. It probably took less than a second for you to do that. That's resilience. Resilience is figuring out a new way to behave when your old ways of behaving aren't working anymore or aren't accessible anymore. I hope you remember this when your old ways don't work for you anymore. We each have it within us to make new choices, try new ways of reacting. Resilient people use a number of ways to deal with stressful situations. They're not stuck on using a specific way of coping. Instead, they shift from one coping strategy to another as needed. It's like having a variety of tools in your toolbox to fix a problem. Just pull a different one out. The next one, practice spirituality. Now, spirituality is a broad concept with room for many perspectives. But in general, we might say, that it includes a sense of connection to something bigger than ourselves, involving a search for meaning in life, or simply a deep sense of aliveness and interconnectedness. Some people experience their spiritual life through a church, temple, mosque, or synagogue affiliation. Organized religion can provide structure, community, and meaning or identity. However, there are many ways that we can practice spirituality maybe through prayer or personal conversations with God or a higher power. Nature or art also provide for an expression of our spirituality. Having religious beliefs or practicing our spirituality has been shown to strengthen a person's resolve. Our next thought is have social support. We need to feel that we're not alone. Research has shown that we need social connectedness to function optimally. This connection to others releases oxytocin, which calms the mind and reduces stress. Reaching out to others is not a sign of weakness, but instead an acknowledgement of knowing your own limitations and that you value human connection. In times of difficulty, reach out to others and ask for help. Reaching out to others and asking for their help is often a gift you give to them. Think back to how you may have felt when you helped a friend. We feel useful. So resilience builds for both the giver and the receiver. During our current socially distancing time, we can still be socially connected to others. Take the time to actively connect. Make a phone call, have a Zoom get together, sit outside and meet, socially distancing, but have those interactions. Talk with others about what you were going through and how you're feeling. We build our strength through connection to others. The next thought about this is be a lifelong learner. Learning's not just for the young, it's also for the young at heart. Keep growing your mind, adapt to new information about the world. This helps to keep you mentally sharp. Ask yourself, am I stuck in my ways? Do you ever tell yourself, mm, I'm too old for this? Hmm, maybe not. Broaden your horizons. Be open to new ideas, meeting new people, exploring new interests, learning new skills. And it doesn't have to be a major accomplishment like learning a new language. It can be as simple as trying a new recipe. Again, thinking back to the previous experiment with touch, widening our perspective, modifying our way of doing something 
and thinking outside the box can help improve our resilience. Next idea is called change the narrative. So when something bad happens to us, we often ruminate about it, right? We play it over and over again in our mind, re-experiencing the pain. We can't let it go and move forward. We remain stuck in playing the tape over and over in our head. What can be helpful is to gain some new insights into the challenges that come our way rather than just ruminate. So there's two parts to this exercise if you choose to try this at some point. The first one is expressive writing. So freely write for 20 minutes about one situation that's bothering you. And there's no agenda, there's no questions to answer. You just write about the thoughts and feelings as they come up that you have about that situation. This exercise is for you and it doesn't have to be well written or well thought out. But do this writing exercise for several days. When we focus and give our thoughts structure and attention, we can gain new perspectives. We process the event, which can help give us a sense of control. In the second part to this change the narrative exercise, it's called find the silver linings. So again, recall the negative event. Try to list three positive things about it. Again, not Pollyanna kind of, but true, accurate, realistic, positive things as you see it. You know, during this time of quarantine, there have been lots of negative events, absolutely. But one of the positives that people have shared with me has been that they have had more meaningful conversations with friends and family and have reconnected with old friends. So for them, even though they've been socially distancing, there's been greater depth and meaning in their relationships. The next one is focus on self-care. Now, I know this topic has been discussed in previous webinars, so I'm, I'm not going to go into details here, but it's important to mention that we will have a hard time being emotionally resilient if we're physically exhausted or poorly nourished. So take care of yourself. Get an annual checkup, eat mostly healthy foods. And I say most, mostly because we all need our junk. It makes us happy. But mostly uh, eat healthy foods. Get moving, do a little exercise, and even if it's just a walk around the block, we need to have some movement. Limit your caffeine, because caffeine acts as a stimulant. So if you're feeling anxious to start with and you're drinking coffee throughout the day, it is just increasing your heart rate and aggravating your anxiety. Limit caffeine. And the last one is spend some time resting or relaxing whenever you can fit it in. There are so many good videos for relaxation on YouTube. You know, a 10 or 20 minute relaxation video can feel like just a little mini vacation during the day, and we could all use more of that. And the last one is control your destiny. So Abraham Lincoln said, a man is as happy as he makes up his mind to be. True. While we cannot control what happens in the world or what other people do, we do have control over how we respond and think about the situation. You know, it's not the situation that causes the stress or the anxiety, but it's our reaction to it. So have you ever noticed people in their cars when you're driving and we're all stuck in traffic? You can look to one side and you can see one person calmly listening to music on the radio, waiting patiently, and the person on the other side, they're ready to blow their gasket. They're fuming, they're pounding the stereo, steering wheel, beeping the horn, just totally agitated. It's the same situation. We're all in traffic, but two totally different reactions. One way we can help ourselves is to say, I have a choice how I'll respond. We're not programmed, we're not robotic. We have a choice. Thinking that every time we face a challenge or difficulty can help us with our resilience. 
identify what your choices are, weigh their pros and cons, decide on which choice, which path to follow, and take it. So I'd like to thank you for taking the time out of your busy day to watch this webinar. I hope you found it to be helpful and gained at least one takeaway skill to use to continue developing your own emotional resilience. I'd like to end with a quote from Mitsuta Masahide, a 17th century Japanese poet. And he said, my barn having burned down, I can now see the moon. Hmm. Quite, quite powerful, isn't it? So thank you so much for your attention. Shirley, I'll pass it back to you. Great, thank you so much, Shirley. Lots of good information. Uh, so certainly if anybody has any questions or comments, we um, are available at this time. We can take a few minutes to, or suggestions. Um, this person says, hello, Terry. I'm trying to remain optimistic that something I want to happen to me sooner than later for me, but this thing also requires a lot of action. The issue is that I cannot even begin to think I'm going to take that action or what specific actions to take to get me there. In a situation like this, what do you suggest? It sounds like the person's trying to remain optimistic about something that's about to happen sooner than later. Um, and it's going to take a lot of, uh, it's going to require a lot of action on that person's part. Mm -hmm. You know, the first thing, oh, I'm sorry. The first thing that came up to my mind is the tool that I had mentioned about writing. Writing can be a very powerful tool for us to use when we're really not sure how things are developing or how to process what we're experiencing. So I really often will encourage uh, individuals to, you know, do some free form writing of writing down your thoughts and feelings associated with a particular, you know, situation that's coming forward. Um, when we write, it really lets a lot come up for us. It helps us process and gain clarity. And in reflection, when we then, look back at the writing from day to day, a lot of times we can start to see certain connections or certain things develop for us. Um, it also helps us when we're processing it to be able to start to break things into smaller steps to move us forward. So I hope that's a, a bit of a helpful tool to use. Great. Uh, so Meg comments, I appreciate the overall message of controlling our reactions being our main source of resilience. Can you provide advice on how to cope when you can manage your stress, specifically during COVID, but a family member sees that stress as not caring, not taking things seriously, which then can cause conflict? Hmm. Okay. Any advice on how to cope when you can manage the stress, but it's another family member sees that as not caring or not taking things seriously. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you know, it sounds like you're on the right track yourself with being able to roll with things, uh, coping, keeping things in perspective. Um, what we can do while we can never control or change someone else's um, beliefs or actions, the best that I think we can do is that we can share where we're coming from. We can, um, you know, kind of explain why we're why we were doing what we're doing, and then ultimately remembering that it's that individual person, the other person's choice, whether they're going to, you know, understand where you're coming from or not. So I think it's important for us to be true to who we are. And, you know, in a very non-judgmental, um, open, warm way, still explain, you know, our position. Um, and the other person, again, will have the choice to understand or not. But at least you will know that you've done 
what you can to um, explain where you're coming from in a, in a, a non-judgmental way. Brilliant. Thank you, Mary. Uh, and here we have another um, question. Sometimes when I'm feeling anxious or down about something, I feel as though I alienate my loved ones because I'm in such a sour mood. It's often hard for me to focus on anything else than what I'm upset about, even when I'm with loved ones, which makes things worse. What techniques do you think would work best to try and counteract this? Okay. Well, I see two things in this situation. You know, when we're feeling anxious, I think one of the things that we can do is to reach out to family members, share our feelings that this is, this is what I'm going through right now, feeling a little anxious. Can I talk about it? Can we spend some time together? That will let you get some help for the anxiety and also let them know what's going on. Now, I understand where you're coming from when you say you don't want to alienate them because to be constantly anxious, you feel like, could be too much of a burden for them to be around all the time. So what I would also suggest as part of that is while talking about your anxiety and um, you know, asking for some support is trying to then kind of put things in perspective and, and try to engage in a, um, an activity that everyone can participate in that is anxiety reducing. So it could be you know, maybe we could go for a walk together. Could we play a board game together? So it will help you kind of get your attention onto something else and it will engage you and your family members in a positive activity. So it will, you know, keep that relationship going well. But also it, initially it lets you be true to who you are in expressing the anxiety without feeling that, you know, we've got to wear a mask all the time uh, with others, which isn't true. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much, Terry. And thank you You're for very welcome. Questions. Um, if you have any additional questions or are looking for more one on one support, please know that JFCS now has phone drop in hours. And um, we have those hours every weekday Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 10 a.m. till noon and Tuesday and Thursday evening, 5 until 7 p.m. During this time, you can connect to a counselor for a 30-minute support session. Please call 609-987-8100, dial zero, and you'll be connected to somebody who can transfer you to a therapist. We will continue to offer community webinars and introduce more interactive groups throughout the summer. On Thursday, July the 9th at 9.30 a.m., you can join me for our first social support group. This group is designed for older adults who are struggling with isolation and need a safe place to connect, share, and find support. I will be leading the group to help facilitate discussions, but there's not gonna be a formal uh, structure to it. We're just gonna meet and, like I said, support and, and talk about whatever's on your mind. Please register in advance. The registration link can be found on our website at www.jfcsonline.org and go to the COVID resource page to get that registration link. At JFCS, we are here. We are all about hope, he healing, and help. We are committed to helping in any way we can with our counseling and food pantry and delivery and senior services. We know hope is needed more than ever and want to be the light with the light of hope with these webinars and other resources for our community. We understand the healing process will be ongoing long after we have weathered the storm and JFCS will be here each phase. Thank you so much for joining us. Take good care. Okay.